What's going on, everyone? Welcome to Decred In Depth. I'm your host, Angelo, and on today's show, I have the DCR Project Lead, Jay Yoakum Pyatt, on here. Jake, what's going on? Not a lot. Uh, another day in the crumbling empire, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll skip the background, of course. Let's, uh, let's get right into it. Jay, what are your thoughts on current events and how CV-19 has impacted the world. Well, it's been it's been quite a bumpy ride for most of us uh, since uh, you know CV nineteen landed in the United States and you know has been spreading throughout the rest of the world for the past you know really th probably four or five months, but it's really gotten bad in the past three months. And um, you know it's a really it's a really interesting uh, process because there's there's been an enormous amount of conflict both about CV nineteen itself. And, um, you know, and then how do we, you know, and then how do we respond to that? And what's the best strategy moving forward? So what we're seeing is, is, you know, we're seeing this, this, you know, this, uh, you know, this disease that's, that's killing people all over the planet in large enough numbers to scare everybody and is, uh, you know, it's having some really serious effects on, on world economies. It's a, it's a, it's a majorly deflationary event, right? It's a very contagious, long asymptomatic phase potentially very lethal, but that depends on how you view, uh, you know, the, the, the fatality data, um, uh, disease and it's, you know, it's spread all over. It, it hits vulnerable populations, like for example, the elderly and people who have, who have comorbidities, but for the most part, it really doesn't affect people who are younger. So if you're under age, say, you know, 60 and you don't have any, any major comorbid comorbidities like, uh, you know, diabetes, obesity, um, or heart disease, you know, or, or other sorts of or cancer, you know, you're in pretty good shape and it's not a big threat to you. But it's really been, it's been fascinating to see how this, you know, how CB19 has led to, has triggered a massive uh, contraction in, you know, in, uh, in financial markets across the, across the planet. And, and what's, you know, what I find so interesting about it, right, is that there's a lot of people who will look at CB19 and say that, oh, CB19 is, this is why the market contracted. But the reality is, is that it isn't why the market contracted. It's just the, it's just what led to the market contracting. So the actual contraction is due to the fact that you know most most developed economies, uh, you know, are massively over leveraged in the sense that they're you know they're running at historically high rates of you know of debt and 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 leverage. So that there's a you know. There's all this credit issuance going on. Everyone's doing stock buybacks, and then you know, once any event occurs that leads to a tightening of you know of the of the credit issuance process, it's going to it's going to have all kinds of outsized economic effects. Understood. Shows how uh, humans have a poor assessment of risk. <laughs> <laughs> for real. Yeah. So for those that are unaware, you know, what's the Fed's purpose, and and how does it operate? So the the Fed is typically uh, maybe a little bit of background about the Fed is in order, which is that um, the Federal Reserve uh, system, and it's the Federal Reserve system because there are you know it's, there's twelve member banks, so it's a system of banks, these twelve banks, and it was created in response to the uh, the Panic of nineteen oh seven. So the Panic of nineteen oh seven was a uh, was another time in in U.S. history where the uh, you know the economy became massively levered up on credit. And then irresponsible things were done with the, with that credit. And then because of the irresponsible nature of people, you know, uh, using that credit, it led to a massive economic contraction, which you know was was at least nominally staved off by several very wealthy uh, bankers, you know, J.P. Morgan being among them, stepping in to you know to 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 uh, to, to try to backstop the U.S. banking system. So so in 1907, what had happened was is that. There were there was a whole bunch of irresponsible lending going on, and a huge amount of lending uh, had been you know uh, credit had been issued to people who were uh, uh, trying to corner the copper market, and the copper market you know a as anybody who's familiar with you know with metal markets or any of these things is you, know, you can it's very very difficult to corner these things right you know there's copper all over the planet there's silver all over the planet there's gold all over the planet you can try to corner these markets but the amount of capital and you know and, and all of that that's required to do that is comical and then there's this massive downside risk which is that you think you've cornered the market but then some other event happens that changes the valuation of the you know the underlying asset 
and then boom, like, you know, the whole, the whole play blows up in your face. And that's effectively what happened, which is this people were trying to corner the, the copper market, it blew up in their face. And then everyone who underwrote that, that process had their, had, you know, a, a, basically a massive uh, default wave, which led to a bank run. And it was really just, a, you know, a mess all around. So the, so the Fed was then created in 1913, several years after the panic of 1907. And the, you know, the stated purpose of it, you know, if we, if we listen to the Federal Reserve Act, which I think everyone here should be pretty skeptical of whatever you see in legislation. If something, if, if, if something states A, B, and C in legislation, you should really be thinking, what, what, are, they, what are they really after here? So the A, B, and C of, of the Federal Reserve System is this, is that there's 12, there's 12 uh, regional banks. Those regional banks work together to, to create a system. And what that system is meant to do is that system is meant to maximize employment, stabilize prices, you know, of, uh, you know, of consumer goods of various types, and then to uh, moderate long, uh, you know, moderate medium to long term interest rates. So all of those those three stated goals are pretty reasonable, and that's that's the Fed's stated purpose. So I think that it's important that we that, that to decouple the stated purpose from the actual purpose, which which we will uh, you know which we'll ascertain throughout the rest of this uh, you know discussion here. So that's so that's really where the Fed came from, and you know what created it. And then in 1913 uh, was when the Fed was was uh, you know the Federal Reserve Act was passed, and then the bank was created. I think it was passed in 1912, and then the the Federal Reserve system was created in 1913. So the Fed reacted historically to the events that transpired. What, what are your thoughts on the reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic from the Fed? Well, what's ended up happening with CB19, right, is, is that it's a, it's a fundamentally deflationary event, right? It sucks money out of, because, you know, because it, it, it collapses people's confidence. It changes all of the assumptions that our economy, which is highly financialized, is based on. That leads to a massive, you know, it's like CB19, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh man, this is going to be, this is going to be a hell of a ride because, you know, because it's very, it spreads very easily, clearly. And, you know, the only way to stop, you know, to, to limit that is to keep people all spread out and then keeping people all spread out is going to basically wreck the economy. So the Fed's response to, uh, you know, to CB19 has been, you know, a, 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 at least a nominally natural one. You have a, you have a deflationary event. And then you want to go, well, deflation causes problems like social, you know, social unrest, not like we have any idea what social unrest would look like, right? Hmm, right. right? Yeah, so social unrest, I mean, maybe, you know, there, there might be social unrest if, uh, you know, if you have a poor, you know, a poorly operating economy. So the, the Fed's reaction is to basically issue credit en masse. And this, is, this happened back in 08. So it's when there are systemic failure modes of the Federal Reserve System, the, you know, the Fed will then issue credit on a massive basis and they do this through a number of different means which you know which we can get into but the way it normally works is right there's a target interest rate so the fed goes hey this is what this is the interest rate we think uh you know uh, uh sh the the markets should have uh you know for for uh you know for, for uh, treasuries and so on so there's a target interest rate. Then there's a couple other things that they can that, that they can fiddle with. So if the economy is doing okay and everything's hunky dory, they'll slowly adjust the target interest rate up and down. And the idea there is is that by adjusting the target interest rate upwards, you 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 cause a tightening of the credit system, right? So there's a higher interest rate. Banks, you know, commercial banks which borrow, you know, which get credit from the Federal Reserve, they don't have to pay as much for that credit that they're getting. So they can, you know, they're more likely to lend it to people who do higher risk things, or excuse me, lower risk things as the, you know, as the interest rate goes up. But then as the interest rate goes down, the opposite happens. Like, you know, you, you want to you wanna get people uh, to spend their money, lower the interest rate, get the credit flowing, you know, start, start spreading that around. So, so the way the Fed operates is, is that it, it, you know, in, in a steady state, it will adjust the target interest rate up and down. But then in when, when there are crises, it will issue credit en masse, and it will do this typically by backstopping credit markets of various sorts. So, for example, it will intervene in the, uh, you know, in the treasury markets. It will intervene in uh, you know, the mortgage-backed security markets. It will intervene in uh, you know, uh, what is it, the bond markets. So it, the Federal Reserve has a number of tools at its disposal that it can use when, uh, you know, when th quote, you know, the shit hits the fan. So in this case, you know, with CB19, the shit quite literally hit the fan. And then 
you know, in this case, it's a deflationary event. So the response is an inflationary response in an effort to try to level things out so that, you know, so that our whole, you know, our whole financialized economy doesn't explode in our face. So from that perspective, I, what I see is I see the, the reaction from the Federal Reserve System as being very predictable, right? You know, there's only so many knobs. There's only so many ways you can turn them. And the Federal Reserve has turned the knobs in, the, in effectively the same way that they did back in 08. So, oh, there's a whole bunch, there's going to be a massive wave of defaults unless we do something like dial the, dial the target interest rate down, which they've done, and then also issue credit and mass to backstop various important credit markets, which they've done. And so, you know, my, you know, my, my personal opinion of this is, is that it is a logical response but it is a but it is an ethically and morally unacceptable response and you know and, and my position there is is that there's there's so many ways to solve problems and you know central banks have been turning knobs back and forth like this for you know uh, roughly a couple hundred years i think bank of england is really the you know, they're the ones who really started this whole this you know this whole direction that we're going with central banking and um it just seems the longer this goes on and the more broken our system becomes the more blatantly unfair all of the, this whole process becomes, you know, oh, the, oh, the, oh, uh, banks are going to become insolvent, and then you know, instead of going, okay, well, let's let the banks become insolvent, you know, the, the, the Fed steps in and effectively subsidizes them to a massive, you know, to a massive degree. So, so there's, you know, there's moral folly, in, you know, in that, which is that if someone can, you know, basically crash a plane into the mountain and go, dude, I need a new plane, you know, the, the process of that person getting a new plane is pretty you know, pretty questionable. And so that's how I feel about the, you know, the Federal Reserve System's reaction to the CB19 pandemic, which is that it's, you know, it's logical, but it's, it, it serves to demonstrate how deeply unfair central banking is, in particular, the, you know, the credit issuance policies, uh, that, you know, that the Federal Reserve has uh, in that context. Jay, what are some of the dangers from this printing and their projected balance sheet reaching these all-time high levels? And what does this mean for the global economy? The, um, you know, the, the, the Fed having a really high, uh, ba you know, balance sheet is, to me, I take it as kind of a metric of the unfairness of the system. If the central bank has to step in and issue tons and tons of credit to stabilize our economy, that to me is, it, it's a measure on how rigged our economy is. When you need to step in and go and give money to everyone in the system, that is not the, that's basically a contraindicator for a, a a system that is working properly. So the you know the balance sheet spiking is an indication that uh, the system is really you know in my view coming apart at the seams and that the it's becoming increasingly unfair. Hmm. And then so, in term in terms of what does that mean for the global economy? The global economy is um, you know. It, it's a reflection of how deeply dependent the world economy is on U.S. dollar liquidity and U.S. dollar credit. You know, when, if if U.S. if U.S. dollar loan, uh, you know, credit issuance tightens, that's very very that's going to be a big pain for most of the rest of the world because there's U.S. dollar denominated debt all over the planet, not just in the United States. So, any bank that's in another country that has any loans denominated in U.S. dollars. If there is a tightening of of U.S. Uh, uh, you know of U.S. dollar credit policy, then what happens is is that th that debt they may have to pay a lot more money to service it, and then that you know the dollar may become a lot stronger. So let's say you take a you know you take a loan in U.S. dollars, and then you I don't know you uh, exchange it to euros, and then you use it for something in Europe. You still have to pay that debt back in the U.S. Do in U.S. dollars. So if there's a credit tightening going on in the you know with uh, you know with the U.S. dollar. Then what ends up happening is, is that that makes the U.S. dollar stronger relative to these other currencies that you may have exchanged to to do whatever you know business you're doing. So this puts everybody in this in this in this wacky position where, beyond the moral folly of you know of having uh, of rigging uh, the banking system and, and issuing all this credit, there's also the this 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 bizarre dependence of the entire world economy on the U.S. dollar system, uh, you know, to the extent that. Uh, that a stronger U.S. dollar and tightening credit policies in the U.S. could lead to massive, uh, you know, massive financial problems all over the planet. Understood. Uh, where do cryptocurrencies play a role in all this? Well, cryptocurrencies, 
you know, I see cryptocurrencies, most of them, and I say most of them because, or, or maybe not most of them, but some of them. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> because everybody's got a different issuance policy for their cryptocurrency, right? You know, there's ICOs that were complete scams. There are, you know, pre-mined, co- you know, other pre-mined coins that didn't ICO that are total scams. There are, you know, uh, what is it, finite, uh, finite issuance, deterministic, finite and deterministic issuance uh, cryptocurrencies that are sketchy as hell too. So it's really a question of, uh, it's really a question of which which cryptocurrencies we're talking about. My my view is this: is that the 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 you know the moral and financial folly that we're seeing from central banks is going to lead to uh, you know a lot more attention for uh, cryptocurrencies, particularly ones that have a finite and deterministic issuance schedule. And, and the reasoning, you know, the reasoning there is, is that when the issuance schedule is deterministic and it's finite, that's just a lot fairer than, uh, you know, arbitrarily issuing credit to, uh, you know, to, to hit some, you know, arbitrary target. Like, for example, uh, uh, what is it, maximizing employment and, you know, uh, and stabilizing prices. Does that, it, it, are those really, you know, mor- you know morally good? Uh, is it sufficiently good on a moral basis to have those targets or is it you know or is it actually bad because then you end up rigging, rigging the system to uh you know to hit those targets so uh, you know i think that c- cryptocurrencies decouple this in the sense that they take away the this notion of targeting and central planning and they replace it with this idea of this is algorithmic and this is nominally fair so i think that what we're going to see in the cryptocurrency space as a result of this and i think to some extent we're we're seeing it right now we're, you know right when cv19 showed up we definitely did not see it because when cv19 showed up it was like whole it was like you know bitmex went down all everybody's exchange rate dumped and uh, you know and there were a lot of people who were super bearish after that but you know my view is is that uh, cryptocurrencies are a long term bet and what you're betting on is you're betting on the fact that uh, that finite deterministic issuance is just a better system than arbitrary infinite in, you know issuance from you know from you know from organizations like the Federal Reserve. So it's really a fairness play, and I think that that fairness play is going to end up benefiting crypto you know these this subset of cryptocurrencies I'm talking about pretty pretty substantially because people want the ability to store their to store their wealth in a way that doesn't just, you know, lose value hand over fist. Agreed. Jay, how do you see round two playing out for CV-19 with the United States ready to reopen the country? Well, so CV-19 is, you know, it's, it's an interesting disease, right? There's, there's so much, there's so much political, uh, I mean, it's the first time in my life I've ever seen a distinctly super overt nation state political agenda attached to how we perceive a disease. Um, it seems like, uh, you know, it, it seems like there are, there's, there's a lot of people, um, at least at this point, as far as I can tell, mostly Democrats who are keen to have very long running lockdowns and to, uh, you know, and to basically really overreact to, to, you know, to CV-19. Now, early on, when the fatality rates were, you know, really, you know, looked really dire, like say between two and ten percent, depending on where you were at, I thought lockdowns weren't such a bad idea. But you know, as the data starts to accumulate, what we're seeing is is we're seeing in, in various places where they're actually releasing this data. And I say where they're releasing this data because I actually live in Chicago, and they're actually making a point not to release this data about Chicago or, or Illinois. And the data I'm talking about is the antibody, uh, the antibody data uh, indicating. The number of people who have tested positive for, you know, for CV-19, as in they've had it, but they never went to a hospital and they were never massively symptomatic. And the data seems to indicate that between 10 and 100 times as many people as you would think if you only tested symptomatic people have CV-19 or are testing positive for the antibodies. Now, what that, that suggests is that suggests that CV-19 spread was far wider and far, you know, far more substantial than you would have guessed by merit of the symptomatic cases that showed up. So, you know, so what I see is, is I see that there's a real, there's a data problem here, which is that there's political objectives or, you know, then there's political objectives to things like having a run, a long running lockdown that, uh, you know, that cut against maybe the science of it. Because if you, if we all sat down and we all did a bunch of experiments and tried to determine objectively what the, what the right path forward was, I think we'd be in a much better position than we are in right now because right now, I mean, the country's as divided as it ever has been between the Democrats and Republicans, which I view, which I view personally mostly as you know, like uh, 
would you prefer to uh, would you prefer to invade to save the children, or would you prefer to invade to get the bad guys? So right. I really don't see a whole lot of difference between the two groups. Um, but what we're seeing is these two groups are going back and forth. You know, Republicans are like no mask, and you know, end the lockdowns, and, and Democrats are like, oh, put your mask on. You know, this is we're going to be locked down for the next two months. And so those two, you know, those two forces are pushing and pulling back and forth, and it's. It's it, it's it's hard to see exactly how this is going to shake out, but what you know on a positive side of things is it looks like the the fact that Georgia and Florida have you know have at least nominally reopened, and I say nominally because even though the lockdown isn't formal, there's you know people are not going out to restaurants and you know bars and stuff like that the same way they were before. So what we're seeing is we're seeing the st certain states are reopening, and it looks like you know at least based on the data that's coming out of them regarding fatalities. Things are looking pretty positive. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a second wave, but there's a lot to this. That is that, uh, you know, round two I see as things are going to get a lot more interesting from the uh, state solvency uh, perspective, particularly in the United States. Because, you know, there's a whole bunch of states, uh, you know, Illinois. Uh, Illinois is almost at the top of the, you know, the top of the trash heap. I guess it really is because we have a, we have serious, serious uh, uh, debt problems here. That is that we, you, you know, it's a, Things are rated junk here, which is bad for loans, right? You pay like several times the uh, you know the interest rate that everybody else does. But the upshot is is that CV nineteen has impacted state economies on a massive scale all over the place, and we're going to see more and more states clamoring for a bailout. And I mean, the 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 scale of these bailouts is 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 ridiculous at this point. Like uh, what was it? There was talk that that uh, Governor Newsom in in California was talking about a $1 trillion bailout for, for just for California. <laughs> and then it's like, well, what about all the other states? It's like, you know, at a certain point, uh, you know, this whole credit issuance pro process with the Federal Reserve needs to be, people need to start asking questions, should we really be doing this? And I think that, you know, round two here with, with CB19 is going to get very, very hairy, uh, you know, from that, from that perspective. Because it's... It, 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 not only is it not clear exactly what's going on because people are getting political with the data, it's also, uh, you know, it's also not clear what's going on because people are going to, uh, you know, there, there's an incentive, there's almost a, a, like a perverse incentive to crash the plane into the mountain so you can stand there and go, hey, dude, I need another plane. I crashed this one into the mountain. And that's kind of what I see playing out here in Illinois, which is that, you know, Illinois' budget and, you know, and finances are just have been in the toilet for quite some time. CB19 is not helping. And then, you know, how does that justify a federal bailout of Illinois? And it's irresponsible govern, you know, governance and government. Understood. Uh, I, I guess that this plays into my next question. What are your thoughts on how the government has handled everything? Well, I think that it's important to to make a distinction here between the the you know the federal government and the state governments. Correct. So one thing that I think is a real strength here is is that the state governments have uh, you know they've had an opportunity to. Uh, They've had an opportunity to all kind of do their own thing. And, and this has, uh, you know, if we had a different president, you know, if it wasn't Trump, what we might see is we might see a more, uh, you know, a more forceful federal response here. But, um, I, you know, Trump, uh, tr you know, Trump is a, a man who divides, who divides people. And as a function of that, what, what I think we're seeing is, is that we're seeing that Trump lacked the political capital to, uh, you know, to, to make a firm federal response Without it, you know, you know, seriously damaging his own uh, his own political ambitions. So, as a function of that, what we're seeing is we're seeing, you know, the the state governments really being in the lead and governors, be, you know, taking the lead. And it really isn't necessarily because Trump wants them to take the lead. It's because Trump Trump is in a position where he can't really take the lead without it, you know, seriously, you know, seriously affecting him. Like, for example, imagine if Trump had declared like a federal lockdown. I mean, I think. I think there's an enormous number of people who would have been just up in arms. Oh, he's a dictator, this and that. And it's like, you know, whereas let's say Obama did try to do the same thing. I think there's a lot of people who might be like, yeah, it's okay if Obama does the lockdown, but it's because Trump had, there's so much, you know, controversy surrounding Trump. He didn't have the political capital to do that. So what we're seeing is, is the states are really running their own balls and there's a massive variance. Uh, you know, at first there wasn't, at first everyone was like pretty much uniformly across the board locking down. But what we're starting to see now is we're starting to see that there is a decently, you know, decently wide variance in how e individual states are handling this. You know, per my comments, uh, you know, uh, you know, just a bit ago about uh, Georgia and Florida, what we're seeing is we're seeing certain states are, you know, really going, you know, more gung ho than others, and going, you know what, I'm gonna be the first guy through the door, even if it means a bullet in the face. 
And I mean, that's the, you know, that's the, the nature of risk. I've invested money and in, in lost it in plenty of things. And as a function of that, it's like I've been the first guy through the door and gotten, the, you know, the shot to the face a couple times. So, so that's happened to me. And I think that uh, even, though people, even though people might, might think it's callous, that's ultimately what you have to do when you're, when you're governing a large state or a large area with a lot of people in it, which is that there's always going to be risks. And some states are deciding to go, you know what, we're going to be the first ones through the door and, you know, they're, they're doing that. And I actually think that that's great, uh, not just for those states themselves so that they can self-determine, but, f uh, but for everyone else. Because, hey, you don't want to be the first guy through the door? It's good to know what happened to the first guy who went through the door. Because if, you know, if the first 10 people who go through the door all, like, you know, catch a bullet, maybe the rest of us don't want to go through that door. Um, so I think that the, the way the U.S. government has handled the crisis is indirectly working out kind of, you know, it's, it's working out better than it is in a lot of other nation states. Other nation states are, are even more top-down and less decentralized than the United States. And as a function of that, you're seeing countrywide lockdowns. So they don't even have an opportunity to test the hypothesis of like, well, what happens if, if somebody opens up a little early? So I think that the U.S. government is uh, strictly by merit of how it's, uh, you know, by merit of how it is, uh, you know, composed is actually uh, weathering this, this crisis a lot better than other, than other nation states. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of people who are who are keen to criticize you know President Trump, but it's like you know if you go around the edges, what did he really do? I think he you know he shut down uh, international travel to some extent or greatly restricted it, and you know beyond that, I'd argue that that's really the biggest change that you know that the federal government really made. So most of the rest of it is just sort of you know like oh who has the ventilators, who doesn't have the ventilators, and then you know sort of resource management. So, so I think that, you know, the federal government played their cards pretty smartly. It could have gone much, much worse. Um, I think that state governments, some of them, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm hugely against how it's being played here in Illinois because, um, you know, it's a particularly oppressive lockdown here. But, uh, you know, the, the fact that not every state has the same policy is actually working out great in my view. So that, hey, South Dakota or North Dakota, you know, these states that don't have a very high population density, they want to, you know, they don't want to do social distancing. They want to keep running their ball how they run it. That's fine. Go for it. And, uh, you know, that seems to be working out fine for them. And I, I think that's great because it, it, it's indirectly a way of bringing a little bit of science back to a situation where it seems like a lot of science has gone out the window. Like, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who says, hey, we got a whole bunch of hypotheses. Let's test them all, see which ones work, and then we'll sort of follow the gradients until we can figure out a solution. And, and the amount of orthodoxy we're seeing in terms of state responses to CV-19 is really, I think it's alarming, but then it's at the same time, the fact that not everybody has the same responses, I think it's working out great. Jay, what are your thoughts on how the federal government has handled the crisis from a monetary standpoint. The uh, the federal government has you know has has passed some legislation which has led to uh, you know more helicopter money of a slightly different kind. Uh, you know the Federal Reserve typically focuses on interest rates. Uh, you know for for treasuries um, it, and um, what is it and credit markets for the most part. Um, however, the U.S. government has focused more directly on things like corporate bailouts and, um, you know, and, and uh, stimulus checks being sent to individuals in the U.S. So I think that the way they're handling it is actually substantially similar to the way the Federal Reserve System is handling it, which is massive credit issuance, which I think uh, can be accurately described as helicopter money. So, uh, you know, deploy the helicopter money to keep people calm and to uh, minimize social unrest and you know, uh, based on the fact that we're talking about this after a, you know, sort of like an unprecedented, you know, <laughs> series of days where people are rioting. I don't know how well this is working to minimize social unrest, but <laughs> man, can you imagine how much worse it would be if they hadn't done that? Yeah, unreal. <laughs> so, the, so the situation is pretty, you know, it's pretty volatile right now. And I think that the way the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve are handling it is that they're, um, you know, they're essentially bailing out their, you know, uh, key, key uh, what is it, key pillars of the, you know, the financial system that, that, that we know and exist in right now. So they're, they're effectively bailing out banks by dialing the uh, target interest rate down so that banks can recapitalize themselves by making more money on their loans, which have a certain, you know, uh, interest rate attached to them, which was higher than that. Um, the, you know, and then they can also recapitalize themselves because the, the Fed has backstopped a number of credit markets. So, so what we're seeing is we're seeing 
what we saw in, in 08, which is effectively a corporate and bank bailout with a little bit of a bailout for the people. And that's more or less how the game is, you know, how the game is played is it's like, you know, it's peanuts for, it's peanuts for us individuals. And then it's, you know, all, and then the lion's share of the bailout goes to these massive bloated corporations and banks that have mismanaged their, uh, you know, their, their, their mismanaged their risks to the point that, uh, you know, the system is ready to, to, you know, to fall apart if these, if these entities, uh, you know, uh, are not recapitalized via bailouts. Understood. So now I need the JYP from the random chat on Riot to come out. <laughs> How is the financial system blatantly rigged? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, this uh, the, the way the system is rigged is it, you know it's it's pretty it's pretty covert. But le, but let me uh, you know the way it's the way it's rigged is is we'll we'll sort of back into it. And the way it's rigged is it's rigged through the credit issuance process. Um, you know, it's very this 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 on the surface the the mandate of the Fed, which is you know the threefold thing, which is to maximize employment, stabilize you know prices for consumer goods, and then you know moderate long you know medium to long term interest rates. Those are those are fine stated goals, but when you start to have a closer look at how the Federal Reserve operates and how it's you know how it's all put together and you know how the Board of Governors works, how the you know. The, uh, the open market committee works. It becomes clear that that the system is very much rigged. I mean, anyone who's you know, I don't know. When I was younger, it wasn't as clear to me that the system was rigged. But it was, it, 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 you know, I, I had some idea when I was in my young twenties that this system is this game is rigged. And the way it's rigged is through the credit issuance process, right? So there's some dimensions to the credit issuance process that we need to you know that we need to talk about. So in terms of the rigging. The first, the first problem is it's run by a central planning committee, and this has been a long-standing complaint of mine about the Bitcoin community, which is that there's no form in the lack of a formal sovereignty mechanism that that you know is accessible by the average person. You're pretty much stuck with a central planning committee. Almost every human, you know, made you know, large, important human organization to date on planet Earth has been based on a central planning committee where there's a handful of people who know how the system works and everybody else is a is basically an is irrelevant that is that the system is run by some hand picked people and that's it everybody else can go suck an egg so you know there could be riots in the streets like the, you know like there are right now and that will do absolutely nothing to change the central planning committee's mind um, you know unless they unless they're particularly affected by you know by these riots so the central planning committee, you know, I'll get into more of the details. Once you have a central planning committee, the sovereignty is always vested in them, and there's no real way to change the system. And so I'll 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 get into that a little later. But um, the other facets of it are the credit issuance process. So the whole thing, the whole all of these credit issuance processes are run by a central planning committee. That's the first problem. The second one is that there is an arbitrary amount of credit that is issued. So if you look at you know, if you look at the way the central bank operates, how do they know when there's been enough credit issued? Well, there really is no, there really is no number. The only, the only thing that really factors in is um, this notion of the reserve requirement. So if there's a commercial bank and it wants to loan money, it wants to borrow money from the Fed, that is the Fed issues credit to that, you know, to that commercial bank, the commercial bank takes, you know, some amount of deposits and then puts it, puts it with the Federal Reserve in, in a special account. Then the Federal Reserve goes, here's 10 times as much money as you've deposited in credit. There you go. Now you can loan this to people. You can loan it to them to buy houses and, you know, go to the casino or whatever it is they want to do or buy cars or, or, or you know, overpay for their education or whatever, whatever it is. So that credit issuance process is, you know, it's effectively at the, you know, at the whims of the commercial banks up to a, uh, you know, a, a sort of a surface level consideration, which is, if a bank doesn't look like, and I say look like, it doesn't have the appearance that it can that it can weather a hit from uh, you know financially, then the Federal Reserve might be like, uh, we don't we don't know about giving you this, this credit. But the upshot is is that right? They can always take their deposits and then get out you know get a ten x leverage uh, from from the Federal Reserve. And then another thing to think about you know in this in this context is how much is enough? Because I could take out a loan for hundred thousand dollars at Bank A. Uh, shuffle some of it to Bank B, 
then Bank B can use some of those funds that were you know, credit issued by the Federal Reserve, deposit them back into Federal Reserve to get another 10x leverage. So that process allows for effectively an arbitrary amount of credit to be, to be generated according to the whims of the commercial banks who, you know, just uh, the only constraint for the commercial banks is they need to have the air of sol solvency and the air of uh, stability. They don't actually need to be stable, but they need to look stable. So you can, you can issue as much credit as you want as long as things look stable. And that is really fundamentally, I mean, that's a really questionable way to go, how much credit is too much? So, you know, when, when, when that's your basis for credit issuance in terms of, you know, the amount being issued, I mean, th that to me is, that's incredibly rigged. That is that the system, th there's no limits on how much credit the system can issue. That's, that, that is a, a very, very big problem. I mean, and then another problem is the, su the subjectivity of the credit issuance process, right? So let's say you and I go to the bank and we want to borrow money. Let's say uh, I have low income and you have a lot of income. The ability to, uh, you know, the ability to repay a loan is really the basis on which you are given a loan. So if I'm a person who has low income, I have a very hard time getting a loan because a bank will look at my income and go, ooh, ah, yeah, you don't make a lot of money. I don't know about this. I, you know, hey, are you sure you're going to be able to pay me this back? So that is really the basis for credit issuance. It's not anything even semi-objective. It's can you pay this back? And then can you pay this back becomes a question of, well, what assets do you have? What collateral do you have? So the process of credit issuance is very much biased such that it goes to people who already have the money. So if I already have, or, you know, I mean, in my example, you have the money. You already have a lot of money. You go to a bank and uh, it's easy for you to get a loan because it's easy for you to repay that loan because you already have money to repay the loan with. So this creates a very biased system in terms of the, the credit issuance process. This is why, you know, uh, low income communities stay low income. It's because they can't get credit to sort of bootstrap themselves out of that. And it's also the same reason why wealthy communities stay wealthy. It's because wealthy people are, you know, j just inherently are given credit. And then that credit is effectively leverage. So the more credit you're issued, the more leverage you have. And so even if you have a really dumb idea, and this is a classic hedge fund move, which is if you have a really dumb idea, like a really dumb ARB that you run between, I don't know, like the, the Japanese yen and the U.S. dollar or something, you can take that, take out a whole bunch of loans, effectively giving you massive amounts of leverage, and then make a massive amount of money from it. So, so this, you know, there's three, there's three facets to how this is rigged. There's the Central Planning Committee, which we'll get into in greater detail shortly. There's the amount of credit issuance, which is effectively arbitrary, uh, you, know, uh, you know, subject to the subject to the pretense of, uh, you, know, you know, or sort of the, the illusion of stability. And then, uh, you know, there's the subjectivity of, the, of this credit issuance process because it's like, you know, people wonder, oh, why are low-income people low-income? It's because they're, they're denied access to credit markets. Why are they denied access to credit markets? Because they're low-income. It, it creates a really nasty catch-22 situation. And, uh, you know, I think that overall, that my takeaway after looking at this system in, in you know, in, in detail is that the system is, it's hopelessly rigged. And this is actually a big part of what drew me to the cryptocurrency space. Hmm. Well, before we get into the planning committees, uh, circling back to your comment on BTC, how is the CC system semi-rigged then? Well, right, so, so cryptocurrencies take the approach, uh, you know, if, you, if we start with Bitcoin, of doing uh, finite and deterministic issuance. And that issuance process is impersonal. There is no subjectivity to it. It's either you solve the you, you solve a math problem in a certain amount of time, or you know, or or you go or, or or you get nothing. So that you know, the fact that these that cryptocurrencies, if you start with Bitcoin and you look at other projects like Decred that have this finite deterministic issuance schedule, that is you know that does away with the uh, with the uh, the amount uh, the arbitrariness in the amount of credit issued and then the arbitrary and then the the subjectivity in the issuance process like who do we issue the credit to oh let's issue it to the the jerk in the suit as opposed to like you know the 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 you know the person who really needs the credit who you know who's you know who's not wearing nice clothes that subjectivity goes out the window and so i think that the cryptocurrency system is, you know cryptocurrencies have a big leg up on central banks um, and the whole in fiat systems just from you know just by that merit that is that if you can't rig the issuance and the you know the issuance process the credit issuance process then you are uh, 
then then you know a lot of the problems with the system you know fade fade away. Now I say a lot because it's not all of them. And uh, the other the other thing to consider is is that even cryptocurrency systems themselves, you could argue argue are a bit rigged. I mean, something I noticed early in the early days in Bitcoin, you know, or or my early days in Bitcoin um, was back in say 2013. I noticed that it's like, man, this mining thing. I you know I thought like it's only a matter of time before all this stuff moves to China. And sure enough, you know, it, it, it did. And so the Chinese, uh, you know, I would argue that the Chinese, uh, you know, between the uh, silicon fabrication and then the uh, logistics of, you know, having these warehouses and so on, they've really rigged the system, the proof of, the proof of work system to, to benefit them. So even though cryptocurrencies are a lot fairer than, um, you know, than, than fiat currencies, they, 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 they are not completely fair but they are less rigged than fiat systems. And, and that much is very much clear. Understood. So who's the federal open market committee and what are the dangers around these central planning groups? So the federal open market committee, there, there's going to be, I'm going to have to backtrack a bit because right. So the federal open market committee is the committee that determines the target interest rate and uh, also manages these crisis mode, uh, you know, credit issuance, uh, uh, you know, sprees that, that have go, gone on in 08 and currently. And so the Federal Open Market Committee is comprised of uh, 12 members. Seven of those members are from the, from the Federal Reserve System Board of Governors. The Board of Governors is um, the sitting president typically appoint, or, you know, what is it? The, the uh, chairman and vice chairman are appointed by the president. Uh, you know, when, when, when they change. And then the other five members of the, of the Board of Governors are also appointed by either former presidents or the current president. Um, and, and what that means is that means seven of the, you know, typically, I would say, now I say typically because there's some caveats here, typically seven of the 12 seats are controlled by people who are presidential appointees. And so because we're going back and forth between Republicans and Democrats, it's common for, you know, some of these people to be Democrats, some of these people to be Republicans, they're political appointments, and it's, you know, it's, it's very much a presidential thing. These people need to be confirmed. So, so there's a, there is a filtering process. You have to get a rubber stamp from, you know, uh, US the U.S. Leg leg legislative branch in order to, you know, serve in these positions. But um, the Board of Governors is a subset of the, uh, you know, of the FOMC. So seven, so the, the Board of Governors is seven seats, and that's seven of the 12. But the caveat here is I believe currently two of those seats are unoccupied. So there are currently five members of the Board of Governors, and, uh, and, and then the other five members of the Open Market Committee are the are, are federal, are federal Reserve Bank, the regional ones, the regional, uh, the, the, <laughs> The Federal Reserve Bank governors, um, but uh, what I want to say, one of them is always the New York is from the New York Fed, and then the other ones there's like a there's like a rolling um, you know there's like a rolling process for for everyone else. So so th this open market committee is is a subset of the Federal Reserve Board governor Federal Reserve Bank governors for each of the twelve regions in the United States, and then the other seven are board of governors. So what what these what these people do is they is they determine what the target interest rate should be, which is our steady state tool for you know for for controlling the credit issuance process, and they also act to uh, make decisions when we when, when the credit issuance process goes into this crisis mode, which we're seeing right now, where the Fed you know where the the, the Fed backstops credit markets, debt markets. Um, uh, corporate bond markets, that one's kind of new. There's a whole bunch of things that they backstop, and then these activities are all managed by the Open Market Committee. So something that's, a, that's important to understand about the, the, the uh, FOMC and then the Board of Governors is, and, the, uh, what is it, and the individual uh, Reserve Bank governors is that the process by which these people are elected is very telling. So something that you, you don't normally see is people talking about how the Federal Reserve, the individual, you know, uh, Reserve Bank governors are elected. So the Federal Reserve Bank presidents are, uh, are each elected by, uh, by the Class B and Class C boards of directors of each of those banks. Now, the Class B board of directors, it represents various industries and it's elected by the member banks. So all the people on that committee are voted, are voted for by member banks. You know, banks who are part of the the federal you know the Federal Reserve System and the U.S. dollar system. Then Class C is, uh, you know, people representing various various industries appointed by the Board of Governors. 
So the board of so so what you what you have is you have the people who are the presidents of each of these uh, Federal Reserve banks are determined by, in the first case, the member banks themselves, you know, it, as in the commercial banks, and then the in the other case they're determined by the board of governors. So both of these so basically between the banks and presidentially appointed you know uh, people who are on the board of governors, between those two people they choose all of the Federal Reserve Bank presidents. So everyone who's on this federal on this FOMC uh, is you know they, they fall into a very small number of groups, and the groups involved are this: there's U.S. presidents, past and present, and they act as a proxy for the U.S. government, right? Because they choose you know oh I want to add this guy, oh I want to add that guy. So they're like the political components. Then there's the U.S. banking industry, which votes for the Class B, uh, which votes for the Class B uh, representatives, which then which then select the presidents. Of, of each one of the banks, and then there's also major U.S. corporations, which are the which are the represent the people who are selected as representatives that or as uh, as directors on the boards of these on these little mini boards of directors. It's a bit convoluted, and I think this was done on purpose. So the you know the the FOMC is an incredibly important um, is an incredibly important um, organization within the Federal Reserve. And they have an enormous amount of power. And as far as you, as far as anyone can, t I mean, as far as I can tell, they really only serve three groups: the U.S. government, the U.S. banking industry, and major U.S. corporations. Got it, Jay. Let's get into the major problems that come with credit issuance. So the problems that arise with credit issuance, right? You know, it's a uh, you know I got into this a little bit earlier, which is that um, which is that it's really all about how much credit is issued and to who this credit is issued. So there's the Central Planning Committee. The Central Planning Committee is, you know, surprise, surprise. The Central Planning Committee compi comprised of U.S. government, uh, uh, you know, U.S. government cutouts and uh, corporate cutouts and banking cutouts bails out the U.S. government, banks, and major corporations. So, so that much is, you know, is is clear with the Central Planning Committee. And then the problems that that happen with credit issuance beyond these sort of crisis credit issuances, where you know the FOMC bails out the people they represent. The other major problems are all, you know, it's just too subjective. As long when you when you can arbitrarily issue credit and you can arbitrarily, uh, you know, uh, choose who receives the credit, you're always going to end up in a system that's really unfair because someone or some group or some people are always making those choices. As long as someone is making these choices about how much credit we have and who gets the credit. Uh, you know, and it's and it's a subjective decision. We're always going to have the kind of problems that we're seeing here. For example, that there are permanent underclasses that uh, you know, why where where there are communities that have real real serious difficulty pulling themselves up out of the low income bucket. And the reason you know credit issuance is a has a huge amount to do with it because you know you go to the nice area of a city and then you go what's not, what what's different about the nice area of the city? Guess what? People there can get credit and can build houses using money that doesn't exist. And then they sell it to get money that does exist, and then uh, you know, and then they borrow more money that doesn't exist to build more houses and continue doing that. So, so the process credit is really power, and uh, it's it's clear that the power is is uh, you know misdistributed in the case of uh, you know in the case of these fiat banking systems. Understood. Now, Jay, we've spoken about this off record. Um... And I forgot where I saw it. I think it was maybe Dalio that quoted it, um, where he said, if CCs got large enough, he could see nation states stepping in and, and studying their growth. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And what are some of the ways that you feel nation states could disrupt CCs? Well, I think that the most obvious way that this would that this would occur is, is that, right? So let's just talk about pure proof of work at a first shot uh, Pure proof of work has has a problem, which is that pure proof of work is not a very good governance mechanism. Uh, it's great for time stamping. You create a game, and then you go, okay, the, the game has solved this math problem in under a certain time limit, and whoever solves it first gets a reward, and that works great, um, you know, for time stamping. But then when you start to get into questions of going, well, should the network upgrade? Should the network not upgrade? Which upgrade should the network make? Those kinds of decisions are much harder to make with with pure proof of work because pure proof of work is a great. It's simple. It does a great job of of time stamping, but it does a very poor job of strongly aligning incentives. For example, 
I could be a proof of work miner and sell all my coins, right? And I'm just dumping on the market. And that's like, that's not very helpful to, you know, to, you know, to the project that you're mining. You're just being, you're just being a US, you're being a fiat opportunist, right? You're just mining the stuff and then being like, give me all the money. Give me all the fiat, right? As opposed to going, listen, I, hey, I want to keep some of this money. So one proof of work miner may, may dump all their coins while another proof of work miner may, may, may hold all their coins. And then it begs the question, if proof of work is the governance mechanism, who should have more say? In a, in a pure proof of work system, both of those miners, if they, if they have the same hash rate, have roughly the same sovereignty in the project. I don't think that's fair, and I think that most people would agree with that. So that what the what this comes down to is is that nation states could spin up a whole bunch of proof, of, you know, spin up a whole bunch of hash power, and then they get they have a they have they can do really questionable things like still manipulate the price of the currency by playing games and selling all their coins or buying you know or not selling all their coins, and then. There's no reflection of that in the governance. So, for example, you can dump all the coins and then do things to, you know, uh, to you know, to drive the price back up and then buy more coins. And there's all kinds of games that can be played. So, I think that that is going to be a very serious problem if proof of work uh, continues to scale up. Which is that as nation states become involved, assuming they do, pure proof of work is going to have a very hard time because of this weak incentive alignment property it has. Whereas proof of stake has a hot, you know, has a strong incentive alignment property where if you want to burn down the village and like, you know, play games with, uh, you know, with the consensus algorithm, you have to own a whole bunch of coins. So that acts as a major deterrent to, uh, to people doing things where they act against the interests of the network. Uh, or, you know, similarly, you know, let's say people are mining empty blocks, which is effectively a denial of service attack, or they're trying to censor transactions. It's much harder to do this in a proof of stake system and much more expensive to do than it is uh, with a proof of work system. So I think that if we see nation states step into this game to try to you know you know get uh, get control, what we're going to see is we're going to see them continuing their unfair behavior, and they're going to have they're going to have a way easier time with proof of work, pure proof of work, than proof of stake or hybrid proof of work proof of stake. Understood. How do you see the CC space emerging? From this crisis and do you think the worst is over? I think that what we're going to see is we're going to see the the CC space uh, strengthen. Uh, my impression is and I say this based on a number of different factors that I've observed in the DCR chats and on Twitter and so on I get the distinct sense we're going into a bull market in terms of a period you know sort of like a timing thing every several years cryptocurrencies have a major bull market and there's like a you know long winters in between these things I get the distinct sense we're going into a bull market, and the and it's it could be a very a very it's going to be a very different bull market because historically, right, these other prior bull markets were in the context of like a massive credit issuance, uh, you know, like a rash of credit issuance, and we don't have that here right now. There's you know credit policies are tightening all over the world. And, you know, they might try to dial the interest rates down to zero, but the reality is, is that banks are going to be facing a wave of defaults and they're going to be, you know, they're going to be tightening their own credit policies, even though the central banks are trying to have these low target rates, um, you know, to, to loosen credit policies. So I think we're going to see, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, we're going to see a bull market, how strong the bull market is, how long the bull market is. These kinds of things are difficult to, to project, but my sense is, is that, the deflationary aspect of CV19 is going to play very much into the strength of the deflationary nature of, you know, finite deterministic issuance cryptocurrencies. So we're going to see cryptocurrencies come out strong. And then in terms of the crisis, in terms of CV19, it's hard to say whether it's whether it's completely over. I'm I'm leaning uh, early on. I was very very bullish on you know on on CV19 in the sense that it was. It looked very, very, very bad. Like a you know fatality rate of two to ten percent. Um, you know it spread super easily. It had a long asymptomatic phase. You know all kinds of bad stuff. But what you know the, what I seem to be observing is is that there's a lot there, there's a lot of effort to you know to muddy the waters and make it unclear what's going on. But the data seems to indicate that the fatality rates are far, far lower than 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 originally thought. Not because the people aren't dying, but because uh, but because the total number of people infected is actually far far greater than you would think if you were just testing symptomatic people. So I think that in all likelihood, um, you know, the CV nineteen crisis is you know the worst of it. I would guess is over, but it's hard to say because uh, you know because if we look at things like the Spanish flu, 
um, there, there are, there are multiple waves in the future and they, they can be very, very brutal. Like for example, this could be much worse during the winter. So it's hard to say, but I'm inclined to say that the worst of CV-19 is over. Um, and, and, and what we're likely to see here is a, a, a CC bull market in a, uh, you know, in a tight fiat credit market, which is, I really like, and what, and because what that means is that means it's a big opportunity for cryptocurrencies to gain ground on fiat currencies, which is something I think is long overdue. And well, I guess I feel like it's long overdue, but at the same time, it's been happening now for you know ten years. Got it. Where do you see DCR playing a role in all this? I think Decred is, you know, our goal is to be a fairer system. Um, we're not. We're, we're not going to do things that are morally hazardous. We're trying to cut the middle path to go, listen, we want to build something sustainable. We want to build something that can, that can continue forward into the future for decades or centuries. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is by being fair with people. And, you know, you can't be, fairness isn't, uh, you know, isn't guaranteeing, um, guaranteeing everyone has the same outcome. So, for example, you know, like two people, one person might make a lot of money, another person might not. There's not a whole lot we can do to fix problems like that. But what we can do is we can is we is we can fix the problem of hey, how do people uh, you know take their wealth that they've generated from whatever work they've been doing and put it into a system that is you know that that does it makes an effort to strike a balance between the person who has you know who has a little and the person who has a lot and do it in a way that we can work together and build things so that you know. It isn't a system that just benefits the wealthy or a system that just benefits the, you know, the, the poor. We, we need to build a system that both of us, you know, both, you know, wealth, wealthy and poor people can participate in that doesn't screw, you know, it's not one, one side isn't screwing the other one, you know, just to get an edge. So I feel like that's, you know, that's where we're going with, with, with Decred and we're trying to build that better system by just making, you know, fairer decisions and making it, you know, less complex. Like, I mean, look at the system for, choosing uh, what is it uh, <laughs> reserve bank presidents I mean that's it's complex enough that most people look at it and go like their eyes glaze over and go like I don't know what the hell they're talking about but uh, you know with decred we're trying to make this as we're trying to make it as simple as possible so that it can you know the system can keep working and people can benefit from it you know for you know for the long term so that's a you know that's how that's how decred fits into this was we're trying to engineer these, you know, the solution to these, you know, you know, immoral and uh, immoral, unethical and, you know, just poorly planned systems. You know, it's about managing people's expectations. We're not trying to say, you know, some people might view our rules as unfair, but you got to you got to meet people in the middle. You can't just take things from people, whether whether they're poor or whether they're wealthy and, uh, you know, reallocate them as you see fit. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta strike the middle balance and, and, and we're trying to do that with Decred. Jay, what do we got next for the project? That's not, that has not been announced yet. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, we're working on, or, you know, there's been some rumblings about, uh, you know, about new ways to apply Politea and, uh, you know, new use cases for Politea. We're, we're making a lot, we've made a lot of progress on Lightning Network. Um, 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 Mateus has, has uh, really moved the peg forward on that. We're going to be seeing, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more interesting off-chain applications of Decred in the next year or two. And we'll have, you know, we, might, we may or may not have one of those pop out very uh -huh. soon. Um, and then in terms of, you know, what's, what, you know, what's next, it's, uh, there, there's a lot of work to do, um, but... I have a feeling that, mo that some of the more boring work is going to be done by the end of 2020. Um, I'm very excited about the treasury stuff getting finished and uh, you know, us being able to move on to the next facet. I mean, the treasury being de decentralized is really a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's really a, um, it's really a, you know, a, 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 like a, a centerpiece of the project and we've been working towards it for years now. So once that's done, we can start to move on to some more interesting, uh, you know, applications um, once we've decentralized that. So it's, there's a lot of things in the pipeline, but, uh, you know, I don't want to get too specific because, uh, you know, Hey, I, I, I also don't want to get scooped. No, keep it vague. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, any closing thoughts? Uh, well, people can find you on Twitter again, which is amazing. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. What is it? Uh, sir, uh I, I've opted into surveillance capitalism <laughs> bullish. <laughs> well, Jay, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's, it's great talking to you, Angelo, and I, and I look forward to catching up with you online.